In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's great to be with all of you. And uh, we'd like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the Mother of God. Mary is the Mother of the Church. Mary is the Mother of each and every one of us. Mary is also known as the Queen of the Apostles. When we pray the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's turn to Mary and ask Mary to pray for us and to pray with us. As we pray the prayer that Mary loves most, and that prayer is the Hail Mary, also known as the angelic salutation. So together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now I'd like to invite to be with us our, our spiritual director. Our spiritual director has many names. Our spiritual director is, is known as the Paraclete. It's also known as the Gift of Gifts. It's also known as the Sweet Guest of Our Soul. Holy Spirit is also our counselor, counselor as well as our consoler. Holy Spirit is also known as our sanctifier in our pursuit of holiness. And if that were not sufficient, the Holy Spirit is also our interior master. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we really don't know how to pray as we ought. <coughs> but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to come to be with us, to pour light into our minds, and to set our hearts on fire with the love of God as we pray the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Queen of the Apostles, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. 
Saint Michael the Archangel, pray for us. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Matthew, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. How true, my friends, the family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. So we come together today, my friends, in our Perseverance family, and I promise that I'll be praying for you. I'll pray for you, especially in the greatest of all prayers. And that prayer is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The prayer is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It's the prayer par excellence. It's the greatest of all prayers. And in that prayer, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, I'll place all of you on the altar. Placing many intentions. But most specifically, I'd like to pray for all of us that we would be open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps this can be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Through the heart of Mary. My next intention, I'd like to pray for our families. For our families. For the conversion of our family members for the sanctification of our family members and for the salvation of our family members. For the conversion of our family members, for the sanctification of our family members, and for the salvation of our family members. Jesus says with utmost clarity, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul in the process? What can we exchange for our soul? That brings me to our last intention. I like to pray, my friends, for Those who will be dying sometime today, that they would die in the peace and friendship of God and be saved. My friends, let's make it a habit to pray often for the dying. And if you're with the dying, to make sure that you pray the chaplet of divine mercy. That's a very powerful prayer, always. But especially for those who, who are dying and not well disposed. So let's pray also for your other intentions. Paul, who will have a prostate cancer operation today, the many other intentions that we have in our hearts, let's place them on the altar. 
and God will bless us most abundantly. Great, my friends. It's great to be with all of you. You know, today we celebrate a great saint. His name is St. Matthew. Hans von Balthasar gives us this beautiful image. He says, when we look up to the heavens at night, we see it speckled with stars. Some of the stars are, are brighter than others. The stars in the firmament of the heavens are symbolic. of the saints that are are in heaven that we one day we also are called we one day we are called also to be to become saints as jesus said be be holy as your heavenly father is holy and the beauty is that if you look up to the sky there are all different stars and they glimmer they shine, they glitter differently. So we're thankful as as Catholics that we we are members of the mystical body of Christ, and the mystical body of Christ has what is called the Church Triumphant, the Church Militant, and the Church Suffering. The church triumphant are the saints who have made it to heaven. The church militant are us, soldiers of Christ, fighting the good fight. The church suffering, of course, would be these souls that are present in purgatory. They're in the process of purification. And given that today, We, just, we celebrate St. Matthew. I'd like to make another invitation. What I've been doing over the past few months is offering short courses. A week ago I finished a short course on the course, and most of these are Bible courses. And the course was on the the book of Jonah, the four chapters of the book of Jonah. Before that, I spent a week in Spanish and in English on the letter of St. James, the five chapters. Next week, starting on Tuesday for three days, I'll be offering a course on a part of St. Matthew, in the course that I'll be giving, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, next week, so that will be September 26th, 27th, 28th at St. Peter Chanel, will be on, the course will be on the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. So in honor of St. Matthew today, the Sermon on the Mount you can find uh, only in the Gospel of St. Uh, of St. Matthew. You have what's called the Sermon, you have the Sermon on the Plain, which we read about a week ago, or maybe two weeks ago, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 6. The Sermon on the Mount that I'll be explaining is Matthew chapter 5 six and seven so each of those three days i'll be spending time on one of those three chapters so i'm really looking forward to that so i invite you to come if you can and that will be matthew chapter five six and seven starting next tuesday at 7 p.m in the church of saint p 
Peter Chanel in Hawaiian Gardens. So we invite you all to be, participate in these mini Bible courses. Then after that, I've gotten already have another one in my mind that will probably be launching shortly after the Sermon on the Mount. There's, the Bible is so rich. It's like a, a gold mine or a mine filled with jewels, and we just have to delve in and, and glean those jewels that God wants to give to us. So, my friends, today we celebrate the feast day of St. Matthew. If you go to church for the Mass of St. Matthew, you're going to see the, pre the, the priest will come out dressed in, in red. And the reason being is that Matthew died as a martyr. He was martyred, according to tradition, in Persia, actually. And also, this liturgical celebration is a feast. So if you go to Mass, the priest will invite us to pray the Gloria. The Gloria. So let's talk about St. Matthew. And if you, some of you have followed The Chosen by Jonathan Rumi, he presents St. Matthew in a very interesting way, you probably remember. So that can even help us to go deeper in our meditation on the call and the mission of St. Matthew by watching The Chosen by Jonathan Rumi. Many people have gotten many special graces from Jonathan Rumi's The Chosen. So, who is this person, St. Matthew? Well, born in Capernaum, not far from Lake Galilee, Matthew was a Jew, and Matthew had a, he had a very special a very special very special uh, occupation. He was a he was a tax collector. Tax collector in which he was levying taxes for the Romans under King Herod. And these tax collectors were very often despised by the Jewish people because they'd be taking money from the Jewish people, they'd be giving it to Rome, then they would be pocketing a lot of the money, some very often levying up the taxes at a higher at a higher price price. So these tax collectors were, were considered by the Jews as basically traitors. and known to be avaricious and greedy and often thieves and sometimes living not not the holiest of lives so let's uh let's let's go to where we find Matthew so the the calling of Matthew my friends you can find the calling of Matthew We can find it is called in Matthew and Mark. 
and Luke, not in John. You can find out what these are called, the, the synoptic gospels, meaning gospels with a certain sameness in themes. The call or vocation of St. Matthew. So we'll go through the gospel for today. But as a background, most likely, most likely, Jesus had seen Matthew, and Matthew had seen Jesus before. This gospel account was probably not the first time, probably not the first time that they had seen each other. But then there's going to come the culminating moment. Somewhat like, if you, somewhat like, the call of Peter, James, Andrew, and John that we see in Luke chapter 5. That Jesus had already talked to Peter and James and Andrew and John. But once the apostles make that miraculous catch of fish, Then it says that they left everything and followed Christ. They left everything and, follow, and followed Christ. So Peter, James, and John, they, they continued their fishing business until Jesus, with them in the boat, Help them to make the miraculous catch of fish such that the two boats were almost sinking. Then it says, Peter and the apostles left everything to follow Christ. So, we can say the same thing. We can say the same thing. with respect to Matthew. So let's go into the into the gospel for today. It says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man named Matthew. Here we have Jesus with his eyes looking at Matthew. He's contemplating Matthew. He has Matthew in his mind and his heart. Matthew is sitting at his customs post. Don't forget that Matthew is a he's a he's a publican, he's a tax collector. Then he said to Matthew. Follow me. Just two words. Follow me. And it says, and he got up and followed him. Sometimes, my friends, we have to read. We have to read be in between the lines. Jesus said those two words, follow me. But I honestly believe that it was not simply the words of Christ, but the penetrating gaze, the penetrating gaze, the loving look, 
of the eyes of Christ and the love that was in his heart moved Matthew in that moment to get up and to follow Christ. See if we can apply the call of Matthew to our own lives. Those words follow me. Jesus addressed to St. Matthew. What about us? What about us? Those words follow me. Those words follow me. Jesus are addressing those words to you and to me. And I believe that those words will resound in your heart. We might stop, enter into our own lives, examine our own hearts, and see What are we still attached to? We go to what is called principle and foundation. Principle and foundation. Principle and foundation. Not to prefer a long life to a short life. Not to prefer health over sickness. Not to prefer Riches over poverty. Not to prefer honors over humiliations. But to choose what is most conducive to the end for which we're... Which, to choose what is most conducive to the end for which we're created. The honor and glory of God and our salvation. We might have some type of sinful attachment. And sometimes, my friends, let's be honest, sometimes, my friends, we can be We can be overly attached to our resentments. Perhaps this is one of our obstacles, is that we've all been hurt in the past. We've all been hurt in the past. However, perhaps we haven't fully forgiven someone in the past that has really hurt us. And this resentment, this hurt that we've experienced, we're not totally willing to relinquish it, to give it up. We're not totally willing to relinquish it or to give it up. We're clinging to it. This is preventing us 
from the true freedom and liberty of the sons and daughters of God. So, very, very important for us to beg for the grace to see what are our disordered attachments and to be able to cut from them. Remember hearing a story related to attachments of the hunters, the hunters in Brazil, hunting, they would be hunt, hunting monkeys. And the way that they would do this, the hunters would pound a, a post in the ground and attach to the post in the ground would be a chain and then attached to the chain would be a coconut. The coconut would be perforated. The milk would be emptied and then they would have a small hole and have nuts. Nuts. Cashews or peanuts walnuts with a really good smell. So the monkey would come up or the monkey would come up and they, monkeys are very curious and they would surround the post, the coconut and the, and the nuts. Then one would put his, his paw in the coconut and the, the hole was so small that once he got his hand in, he couldn't get it out unless he would be grabbing onto the nuts. The only way in which he could free himself, his hand would be, he'd have to open up his hands and relinquish the nuts, but he'd be squealing and yelling. And that would be the signal. That'd be the signal for the hunters to come and throw the net around the monkey, then they have the monkey. He would just have to open up his paw and let go of the nuts. Perhaps we have a little bit of this monkey within us. This monkey within us. We're clinging to certain persons, places, things, ideas, philosophies, resentments, our past, our future. We're clinging to things. And if we cling to things, then we cannot walk hand in hand <coughs> with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're clinging to things. We cannot walk hand in hand with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We want to experience the liberty and the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. So Matthew, going back to St. Matthew, Matthew at his customs post was approached by Christ and Jesus said, follow me. Those two words were enough to open up Matthew's heart so that Matthew would leave everything to follow Christ. But as I said, we have to sometimes read between the lines. I really believe it was also the loving gaze of Christ that penetrated the very depths of the soul of Matthew and he capitulated. He gave in and he followed Christ. And that was the best moment That was the best moment in the life of Matthew. So that's the first part of the gospel today. 
It's the call of Matthew and Matthew's generous response. There is a comment on this by St. Augustine, the doctor of grace. And he says that Jesus Christ is the pilgrim, pilgrim walking. And Augustine says Jesus Christ is the pilgrim walking and knocking at the door of our hearts. It could be that once he knocks at the door of our hearts and we say no, that he will not return again. So let's be open to God. As the psalmist points out, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. Another biblical passage is taken from Revelation or the book of Apocalypse chapter 3. For we hear, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens up the door, I will come in and dine with him and he will dine with me. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens, I will open up the door and I will sit and dine with him and he'll dine with me. So today, Jesus is knocking at the door of your hearts as he knocked at the door of Matthew. So as a result, as a result of this call of Matthew, Matthew had money. He had economic means. To show his conversion, Matthew invites Jesus and some of his other disciples to dine with him, to dine with him. To dine with him. That very night. So right away, Matthew, right away, Matthew, is already becoming an apostle, trying to draw people to Christ. Matthew, perhaps had in his mind, because he's going to be inviting a really motley group of individuals. A really motley group of, group of individuals. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, a really motley group of individuals. And I believe that Matthew had this conviction that if that if these individuals would encounter Christ then they would be converted and be willing to follow Christ and they would be saved that's really why we're here. We're here in this world to be saved. So let's go to Matthew's house now. Let's try to um, try to utilize our imagination. Imagine the house. Matthew is there. There's a huge banquet. There's a lot to eat. There's some wine. The house is full. You got some of the apostles there. Jesus is the guest, the primary guest. But he's surrounded by tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. 
And who else was there? The Pharisees. Many of the Pharisees we see in the Gospels, they had a tendency to to, con to condemn others. Many were self-righteous. Many thought that they were perfect. Many thought because they followed the letter of the law that they had done everything. So the Pharisees are very carefully looking at Christ so that they can so that they can condemn him. Very carefully looking at Christ so that they can they can condemn him. So they see Jesus surrounded by these sinners and they talk to the disciples. They say, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, they're already condemning Jesus. They're condemning these tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus is not confronted directly by the Pharisee, but he, but he hears what they're saying. He's able to read their minds anyway. And Jesus responded as such. Those who are well do not need a physician. But the sick do. And then Jesus goes on to say, Go and learn the meaning of the words. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus responds, as always, perfectly. These Pharisees, they were <coughs> focusing only on the law. And they had a condemning attitude. So here, my friends, we have the wonderful call. of St. Matthew. So from that time on, Matthew, Matthew will be a faithful follower of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He'll be a faithful follower of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's pray for the grace also that perhaps we, we, we might have a little bit of the Pharisees within us. That we look at others and we have a tendency possibly to look and to, to condemn others. Whereas perhaps it's better just to look into our, our own lives and see what we have to change, because we are sinners too. Now after that, Matthew, leaving everything, will follow Christ. There's a list of things that I was able to write down and what 
Matthew would have experienced after he said yes to Christ, leaving everything to follow Christ, as the apostles, as Peter, James, and John did also. Matthew saw the many miracles of Christ. The call of Matthew actually comes right after Jesus hears, heals the paralytic. This we see in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus heals the paralytic and then Matthew is called. So Matthew was an eyewitness of many of the miracles of Christ and he would write them down in his Gospel. And in Jonathan Rumi's The Chosen, you probably remember the scene in which Jesus, there's one of the episodes, which is the Sermon on the Mount, and you can see Matthew with his pen and his scroll. He's writing down and he's writing down and he's writing down. And then Jesus meets with Matthew and they're going through the Sermon on the Mount before eventually it's going to be published. Beautiful scene. Matthew was writing and writing and writing. By the way, those who've just tuned in to me, I'm going to be giving a course on the Sermon on the Mount starting next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So Matthew also spent time with Jesus. This was the dynamic of the public life of Christ. He would go out and Jesus would preach to the multitude. He would heal the sick. He would cast out devils. He would cast out devils. Then, at night, Jesus would retire and spend the night with his apostles. Jesus had no set abode. We read that Jesus said, the foxes have their holes. The birds of the air have their nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So in the evening, Jesus would spend time with Peter, James, and John, Matthew, and the apostles, and he would explain to the apostles in greater detail the meaning of his words and his actions. We can do that every time we make a holy hour. Matthew also heard the parables that Jesus taught. Matthew was there at the end of the life of Christ. Matthew was sitting there at the table at the Last Supper on Holy Thursday. And Matthew heard the long discourse that Jesus gave at the Last Supper. Matthew does not record the Last Supper discourse, but that's recorded by St. John. John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Those five chapters are what are called the Last Supper Discourse. Matthew was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not the closest to Jesus, but the distance that someone can throw a stone. 
for fear, Matthew got up and fled when Jesus was arrested for fear. But then he would come back. Matthew saw the risen Lord. Matthew was there in the upper room. This you can read in John chapter 21. Easter. And Jesus goes through the door. And he greets him and says, Shalom. Peace be with you. Then Jesus breathed on Matthew as well as the other apostles. Matthew was exposed to the breath of Christ. He breathed on them. And Jesus said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they will be forgiven. Whose sins you hold bound, they will be held bound. Jesus was giving Matthew, as well as the apostles, he was giving them the power to forgive sins in the name of Christ. Matthew was there when our Lord leaves the earth, and actually the last chapter of Matthew, which is Matthew chapter 28, He sees Jesus as Jesus leaves the apostles. And he says, All power in heaven and earth are given to me. And Jesus says to Matthew and the apostles, Go out now to all nations. Go out now to all nations. Teach them all that I taught you. And baptize them. And baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And then Matthew will be with the Apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary in the upper room. Making your treat. A nine day retreat. He's in silence with Mary and the Apostles. He's praying, fasting. And then the Holy Spirit descends upon Matthew and the other apostles. That's called Pentecost. And then from that moment on, Matthew is transformed. Matthew will be sent, like the apostles, to the four corners of the earth. And according to tradition, Matthew was martyred. They say that Matthew was perhaps martyred in Persia. So my friends, let's imagine that we're Matthew today. Jesus is saying to all of you, Follow me. Follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. Let's accept the challenge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I invite all of you to I invite all of you to share our message to the whole world. 
And in honor of St. Matthew, I'd like to give all of you a very special blessing today. That we would sink deep, deeply into the riches of the Word of God. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Amen. Amen. Amen.